Hello, everyone. Thank you, Pastor Lomakam, for the beautiful song. Wasn't that lovely? It's good to be here again at 3 a.m. in uh, southern Illinois. I'll bring you greetings from sunny California. Any Californians in the midst? Wow, we have Californians in the midst. Praise the Lord. I want to send a greetings to uh, my churches, uh, Cambrian Park SDA Church and Las Gatas SDA Church in San Jose. They're probably not watching because they're tired of listening to me speak every Sabbath. But uh, those of you that are watching in San Jose, I, I send you greetings. Um, I'm very, very excited about the message uh, this morning, and I'm excited to hear about the other presentations that are here. And I always love coming to 3ABN uh, camp meeting because it's kind of like a little bit of heaven on earth. Amen? You have so many different perspectives and so many relevant messages that are shared. It's almost like, wow, I wish this never finished. And I think that's what heaven's going to be like, except the guest speaker is going to be Jesus. Amen? Amen? So I'm looking forward to that camp meeting. That's a camp meeting you do not want to miss. Uh, before we begin, I want to invite you to bow your heads with me as we invite the real speaker, which is the Holy Spirit. Pray with me. Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege you've given us to be called sons and daughters of God. And Lord, we need your presence, we need your inspiration, and we need your insight as we dive into your word. Father, we have not come to hear the words of a man. Thus, I pray that you hide me behind the cross because we have come to hear Jesus. May we see him May we feel him. May we hear him. This is my prayer in his name. Amen. Our presentation uh, is entitled, um, Preparing Your Home for the Second Coming of Christ. And, you know, I've, I, uh, I live, I live in, a, in, a, in a home, and, uh, you know, it's hard enough to prepare your home for, for relatives, right? It's hard enough to prepare your home. Somebody said, yes, somebody's testifying up here in the front. Uh, it's hard enough to, to prepare your home for visitors and, and for guests. Prepare your home for the second coming seems a, a bit overwhelming, does it not? You know, I remember um, my mother always gets at me when she comes and visits my home uh, periodically. And she always says, Jay, you know, why is it that you, you do this? Or why don't you get nicer curtains? Or why? Does anybody have any mothers that are like that? <laughs> you know, she's kind of like the, my fashion, like my interior designer police. And every time she visits me, she's always giving me counsel uh, oh, you know, you got to do this, you got to do that. And what I love about my mother is that every time she comes visits me, if it's for the week or for the weekend, in the course of a few days, she turns my house into like a bachelor pad, right? Into like Pier 1 Imports, okay? <laughs> Anybody been to Pier 1 Imports? You walk in and just the fragrance just... Oh, like your stress levels just immediately drop when you go to Pier 1 Imports. I just go in there for the fragrance because I don't know what I'm... I don't know what I'm buying. I don't know where to start. And that's kind of how my mother does it. I don't know how she does it. She just has magical hands and she has a touch for it. I think it's a mother thing. And, uh, but I would love to, to, to think that that's kind of what we're supposed to do, uh, spiritually speaking, in our homes, preparing our homes for the second coming of Christ. Amen? Because the second coming of Christ is not so much an event in the future as it is a very, very special guest approaching the atmosphere. Amen? And as much as we kind of scramble when we hear last minute that uh, there's a guest that's going to be coming in the next few minutes, oh, put all of this stuff under the bed. You guys ever done that before? <laughs> Don't raise your hand. Um, you know, that's kind of similar with, with us when it comes to the, the, the coming of Christ. You know, we have to get our houses in order. We have to get our homes in order. And I think the Bible is kind of like the manual that teaches you and I how to get our homes in order for the second coming of Christ. And the reason why this is such a critical point is because, you know, ever since I've, I've started working as a pastor, I've realized that the number one issue that I have found, maybe there's another seasoned pastor that's been working that has a lot more experience. Maybe I, I haven't tapped into that person's insight. But at least right now where I'm at in my ministry, I see that the number one issue, 99.9% of the issues in my churches, I see to be a home issue amen that somehow is transferred into the board meetings amen that is transferred into the committee meetings that is transferred into the different you know things that we do at church and that's why i believe that if we understand the science of the home if we understand how to get our homes on fire for the lord i think the whole getting our church on fire is just kind of the the, the, the product the second product of that initial uh plan so i want to invite you to open your bibles to revelation chapter 12 because in Revelation chapter 12, of course, there's always 
The Bible has good news, but the good news is only as good as the bad news is bad. And in Revelation chapter 12, what we see is that the Bible is kind of unveiling, um, revealing, exposing an enemy that is trying to attack not only the church, but fundamentally that is attacking our homes. And in Revelation chapter 12, when you're in Revelation chapter 12, say aloud, amen, please. Amen. Revelation chapter 12, beginning in verse 17, very popular text. The Bible tells us the dragon was enraged with the woman. By the way, the subtitle of preparing your home for the second coming, this is part one, by the way. The subtitle for this uh, would be when the dragon knocks on your door. Okay? It sounds like a horror flick, but it isn't. Amen? Verse 17, and the dragon was enraged with the woman and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 12 that the dragon, who if you read earlier in Revelation chapter 12, it is identified as that old serpent called the devil and Satan is enraged with the woman. Now Bible students, who does the woman represent in Bible prophecy? The church. So the dragon is angry at the church, because he's angry at the church, he wants to attack the church. Now, let me ask you this question. When you consider the church, what is the church? What is the church made up of? They're made up of people. You guys are very good. You guys are a good bunch this morning. The church is made up of people, but generally speaking, if you notice the people that come into your church, they at times, not always, but at times they come in units. Have you noticed that? Sometimes they come in units, not always, because sometimes some people get there earlier than others, but that's a whole... Another seminar for another day. Getting to church on time. <laughs> I'm going to resist the temptation of deviating from my presentation. So when you look at, at, at church, and when you see people coming into the Sabbath school program, etc., you see them coming in by units, yeah? What do we normally call these units? We call them families, right? And these families usually spend the bulk amount of time together where? At home, yeah, in a house, which if you actually study carefully what the Bible teaches, it's actually a little church, amen? That's why the father or the husband is referred to as the priest. Now, where do priests usually hang out at? They hang out in sanctuaries, right? They hang out in temples, they hang out in tabernacles. So if the father or the husband is called the priest of the home, well, then that must mean that the home is really a sanctuary. The home really is a tabernacle. The home really is a, a temple. But let me ask you a question. How many of us treat our homes like a sanctuary? How many of us treat our homes like a temple? How many of us treat our home like a tabernacle? Not really, right? We, usually, we rarely consider our homes being a place of, of sacred and holiness, yeah? I think this is the fundamental issue that we're having in having issues and problems in our church. We need to rediscover what the home is. In fact, uh, some secular, interesting, secular historians have considered that when they have investigated some of the, the worst epochs of Earth's history, when they've seen the, the, the disintegration of culture and the disintegration of civilization, they've actually tied that to the disintegration of the home. So what they've seen, they've shown, they've made connections to some of the worst times uh, some, some of the worst eras in, in, in Earth's history, and they've seen that the, the reason why it has it's been a, a negative outflow or a negative manifestation or a negative expression is because all of that was rooted into the home. The Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 12 that the dragon is trying to attack the church. But ladies and gentlemen, we have just identified that the church is nothing more than people who come in by units, yeah, that we call families that spend the bulk of their time at home. So if the devil is going to do a successful job in attacking the church or the woman, which unfortunately he's doing a pretty good job, he's going to do so not so much bringing his weaponry, all of his bullets and all of his grenades at church. Amen? He's going to focus primarily on bringing his grenades in the home. Because if he can conquer your home, ladies and gentlemen, he conquers the church. 
So that's why we need to be more vigilant when we come home than when we actually go to church. And that's what I believe we need to rediscover and we need to really take into consideration where the spirituality and what condition our homes are in. In Revelation chapter 12, earlier in the, in the chapter, the dragon was trying to take out Jesus at his birth, if you read carefully. But, of course, he was unsuccessful. And when you look at the earthly ministry of Christ, you always see the dragon trying to take Jesus out in different scenarios. At his birth, he tried through Herod, unsuccessful. He tried again in the wilderness, unsuccessful. And I like to think that the dragon was crouching in the Garden of Gethsemane as he was trying to discourage Christ to deviate from the plan of salvation. And the Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 12 that the man-child was caught up to heaven. And of course, that's referring to the resurrection. So the dragon was unsuccessful in taking out Jesus in Revelation chapter 12. So the dragon now has shifted his target from Christ because now he's no longer capable of attacking Christ to attacking the object of God's affection. And that, of course, is none other than the church. We're told that the church is God's appointed agency for the salvation of souls. We're told that the church is the most important community that God regards on planet earth. So obviously, the devil is going to try to attack that which is, in Christ's consideration, the most important group of individuals. The devil is not going to knock on your door and say, hello, I'm the devil. I'm here to take you out. That would be kind of a little bit obvious, no? The Bible tells us that, that the devil is cunning, yeah? He's clever. So he's not going to come to you as an enemy. He's going to masquerade himself as a friend. And unfortunately, I see that the devil has been very, very effective in masquerading himself as a friend. You see, when you look at the dragon's tactics throughout Earth's history... During the Dark Ages, how was it that the dragon attacked the church? Persecution. We read so many different accounts of many, many martyrs that were burned at the stake. Many, many martyrs that suffered through the pains of, of the racks, right? And the different torture uh, instruments that were being used to put away the heretics. So the dragon, the way that he dealt with it is he attacked the church from the outside. But he realized that there was a problem. Because for every martyr that he would assassinate, ten martyrs would be revived. In fact, I think it's the story of John Calvin. I forget the details where he literally was probably 12 or 13 years old. I forget my details. Don't quote me on that. He was probably a little boy when he was witnessing the death of a martyr who was burned at the stake. And it was that experience that actually launched John Calvin's inspiration to begin the work, continue the work of reform. So the dragon's like, wait a second, this is not working out. We're attacking the church from the outside, and they're only multiplying faster. So the dragon had to shift gears from attacking the church from the outside, from now attacking the church from the inside. And I believe that he's even shifted again. He says, no, 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 no. This is not as effective. We shouldn't be attacking the church in the sanctuary. We shouldn't be attacking the church during potluck. We shouldn't be attacking the church in, in, in the pulpit. We need to attack the church when the church is, when they have their guard down. And when does that usually happen, ladies and gentlemen? When we're at church? No, that usually happens when we're at home. How many of you remember the story of the Trojans, the Battle of Troy? If you remember carefully, and of course there's many different uh, versions and variations of the story, but... Traditionally, the Greeks were trying to take over the city of Troy for 10 years, you know, 10 years plus, unsuccessful. So finally, what did they do in order to take over the city of Troy? They built a wooden horse, right? The Trojan horse. And of course, this is a common phrase used for different uh, gimmicks and uh, different little trickery schemes. But the Trojan horse legend, uh, of course, is known for... Um, this big, giant wooden horse that was constructed by the Greeks and inside... The Trojan horse, there was about 30 to 40 soldiers. And there was about two or three in the, in the part of the mouth, right? And as the, this, this horse was kind of passing the gates to the city of Troy, it was supposed to be a gift, right? Kind of like a truce. We're at peace, right? Let's put all this strife behind us. And it is fascinating. Because when you read that story, it is not until the sun went down that 
the Trojans, or the Trojan horse rather, finally the soldiers, the Greek soldiers, came out of the Trojan horse and they conquered the city of Troy that night. They didn't do it during daylight, right? Because then everybody obviously would be alert. They would be vigilant. They waited for the sun to go down <laughs> when everybody was asleep and their guard was down because they knew that that is when the Trojans would be the most vulnerable for defeat. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe that the dragon, when he knocks on our door, he subtly puts Trojan horses into our homes. And unfortunately, those Trojan horses that he introduces into our homes are not empty. They're filled with many different influences, should I say, many different soldiers that he has that are there dedicated for the spiritual ruin of God's people. The dragon is knocking on our doors. And so many Trojan horses are coming in and we don't even realize it. And just like the Greeks waited until sundown, I think one of the biggest times that the Satan takes advantage of God's people is after sundown. Right? He's not going to attack you on the, on, the, on the Sabbath hours, right? Because that's when we have, we're, we're the, we have our best clothing on, right? We're in the Sabbath mode. We're, we're talking the right talks. We're saying the right things. We're doing the right things. Some of us, amen. Um, uh, some of you go home and do lay activities, right? You lay down and sleep. Um, but the devil, the dragon, waits for you to go home after sundown. And if you're a gentleman, he waits for you to loosen your tie. And if you're a lady, he waits for you to take your heels off. And that's when, I don't know what it is, right? Have you noticed that? As soon as you take your, your you loosen your tie, gentlemen, all of a sudden you just become like, oh, right? Become just unkind for some reason. And ladies, I'm not going to say anything about the ladies. Amen? I don't want to get in trouble. <laughs> but you take the heels off and you know, you know what that is, right? So the devil is focusing primarily when God's people put their guard down. And that is when arguments take place in the home, yeah? That is when Trojan horses come in and is unsupervised by God's people. And ladies and gentlemen, I believe that the reason why our church, and this is, of course, is corporately speaking. We're talking about, you know, every church is kind of struggling, spiritually speaking. It is because the devil has foothold in our homes. He has foothold in our living rooms, in the conversations, the former Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev reportedly told the following story to teach the need for vigilance. At a time when there was a, a wave of petty theft in the USSR, the story goes, the Soviet authorities put guards at many of the state-owned factories. At one of the timber works in Leningrad, the guard knew the workers very, very well. The first evening, uh, I can't pronounce his name very well, Pyotr Petrovich came out with a wheelbarrow and on the wheelbarrow, a great bulky sack with a suspicious-looking object inside. And the guard approached Petrovich, and he says, Come on, Petrovich, what have you got there? Petrovich says, Just sawdust and shavings. The guard said, Come on, I wasn't born yesterday, tip it out. Petrovich did, and out came nothing but sawdust and shavings. So he was allowed to put it all back again and go home. The same thing happened every night all week, and the guard was getting extremely frustrated. Finally, his curiosity overcame his frustration. The guard said, Petrovich, I know you. Tell me what you're smuggling out of here, and I'll let you go. Petrovich responded, wheelbarrows. <laughs> Clever. Amen? I believe that the devil is smuggling into our homes wheelbarrows. Amen? And in the, in the process of being vigilant, for some reason, he's caught, off, caught us off guard and that is why he's made his way into our homes. Is it possible that the dragon is smuggling things into your home without you even knowing it? Is it possible that right now you're experiencing a, a particular spiritual uh, obstacle in your life that is keeping you, is inhibiting you from going to the next level? Ladies and gentlemen, don't attack the pastor, amen? <laughs> don't attack the elders. Amen. Go to your living room. And attack your living room. Amen? We have, to, we have to assess ourselves and ask ourselves a question. Where are we in our spiritual walk? I want to invite you to open your Bibles to the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is in the Old Testament, of course. And in Deuteronomy chapter 6, we, we read a fascinating text that teaches us kind of an interesting principle of, of being vigilant, yeah? Particularly in our homes and in our family circles. Deuteronomy chapter 6. 
And when you're there, please say amen. amen. And in verse 4, we have the popular uh, text, that what they, what they call the Shema, right? Shema Israel, Adonai Elohanu, Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your where? House. When you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontless between your eyes. Notice verse 9. You shall write them on where? The doorpost of your house and on your gates. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not suggesting that immediately after this presentation that you run over to a Christian bookstore and you get one of those little placards in front of your doorpost and that all of your problems are going to disintegrate. Amen? If that's what you think, you've misunderstood the point. Amen? This is talking about a spiritual principle that the teachings of God's Word, amen, needs to be at the front of our doorposts. Yeah? The Jews were particularly instructed that this is exactly what they need to do. In fact, if you run over to chapter 11, you're there in chapter 6, run over to chapter 11, and he takes it to the next level in verse 18. Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 18, Therefore you shall lay up these words of mine in your heart and in your soul and bind them as a sign on your hand. They shall be as frontless between your eyes. You shall teach them to your children, speaking of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. And you shall write them on the where? doorpost of your house and on your gates. Why? That your days and the days of your children may be what? Multiplied in the land of which the Lord swore to your fathers to give them, like the days of the heavens above the earth. For if you carefully keep all these commandments which I command you to do, to love the Lord your God, to walk in all His ways, and to hold fast to Him, then the Lord will drive out all of these nations from before you, and you will dispossess greater and mightier nations than yourselves. Every place on which the sole of your foot treads shall be yours, from the wilderness and Lebanon, from the river, uh, the river Euphrates, even to the western sea shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand against you. The Lord your God will put the dread of you and the fear of you upon all the land where you tread, just as he has said to you. Isn't it fascinating? Deuteronomy chapter 11, God is counseling his people. He says, listen, do you want to have victory? Do you want to take over nations? Do you want to dispossess those enemies of God and take over the lands that God has promised you? Notice he doesn't tell them to go and get artillery. Amen? He doesn't tell them to go get guns. He doesn't go tell them, okay, now develop a, a good uh, art of war. No, he simply says, start where? Start in your house. He says, go home. Teach the very things that you believe to your children. And he says, put it in your doorpost in the front of your gates. If you do this, he says, I will dispossess the nations. I believe that there's forces. There's spiritual nations that are dominating our homes. Amen? There are Canaanites in our homes. There are, there are Jebusites in our living rooms that need to be dispossessed. And the only way we can do this my friends, is if we resurrect the spirit of spirituality in our homes. One of those things that we need to do is resurrect the spirit of family worship. Amen? Amen. By the way, there's an art that's, that's almost extinct these days. And we wonder why our young people, when they come to church, they're... <laughs> right? Or they're texting away. Well, the reason why is very simple. is because we're not training them in the home. So they come to church, this is weird. How do, what is this preachy preacher talking about? What is all these holy people doing? You follow? Whereas if we train them during the week, they come like, oh, I remember reading this on Tuesday. Mom was reading about this. Oh, that's, oh yeah, we were just praying for sister so-and-so. You follow? It's a part of life now. But what happens is that our young people come to church, they're not trained, and then they act the way they act because they're a product of their environment, i.e. the home, and then we attack them, yeah, for not living up to an unrealistic expectation that we have imposed upon them. Amen? And that's why our young people are leaving the church left and right. Why? Because the home is not what it's supposed to be. And we're told that the home needs to be a training center. Amen? Amen. To be, learn how to live in the home above. And that's why God, and that's why the devil is, there's a war between these two things. And when you read about Exodus chapter 12, we won't go there for the sake of time, but when you read in Exodus chapter 12 during the plagues, you remember the last plague? What was the last plague about? It was the death of the firstborn. Yeah. How were God's people going to be spared from this plague? They had to get a lamb. They had to get the blood. And where did they have to apply the blood, ladies and gentlemen? Doorpost of where? Of their homes. 
Deuteronomy, we see that the Word of God needs to be at the doorpost of our, of our homes. Number two, we see that the book of Exodus tells us that the blood of the Lamb needs to be dripping from our homes. Amen? And the Bible tells us that the destroyer would pass over that home. I think you're making the applications already. I don't even need to do it. In other words, when our homes are founded upon the Word of God, amen, and when our homes are washed in the blood, God is going to pass over the plagues upon our homes. Remember the, remember the question is, preparation, how do we prepare our homes for the second coming of Christ? Deuteronomy and Exodus teach us some of the foundational principles. Our homes need to be the place where the Word of God is meditated upon, amen, is read out loud amongst the presence of family members, and the blood of Jesus needs to be magnified and exalted in our homes. When the devil comes, when the dragon comes knocking on the door and he sees blood, and he sees the Word of God, what do you think he's going to do, ladies and gentlemen? He's like, you know what, I think I got the wrong address. Let me... Uh... If the home is full of the Spirit of God, if the home is full of reverence, the church will be full of all these things. There's a lot of talk about reverence in the church, right? Well, the re the, it's very simple. The reason why there is irreverence in the church is because there's irreverence in the home. Right? The reason why is because we have not trained ourselves to be in the company of angels. We don't know how to behave in the midst of holiness. Hence, when we come to church, we bring the vulgarity, yeah? And we bring the earthliness into the church setting. And that's why it's irreverent. So many times we attack and we try to create reverence in the church when really, obviously we need to do the best that we can to do that. But the point is that it doesn't start in the church. It starts in the home. And that's what we need to do. We need to reconsider our approaches when we deal with these things. How many of you remember uh, the encounter that Moses had with the God of Israel out in the desert? The burning bush. Remember that? What did the burning bush say? Take, your take the sandals off your feet. Why? Because where you're standing is holy ground. Now, let me ask you a question. Where was Moses? Was Moses at the, the burning bush uh, Christian fellowship? You follow? Was that a church? Was he at camp meeting? No. He was literally out in the middle of nowhere. But the reason why God told him to take his sandals off, it's because the presence of God made that ground holy. Ladies and gentlemen, what I'm submitting to you this, this day is that I believe that we need to take our sandals off our feet when we enter into our homes. Now, we had to do that literally speaking when I grew up, so it's not that difficult. Because we always used to play in the mud, and my mom's like, no, 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 you're not, you, guys not, you are not walking in this house with that stuff in here, right? You guys, how many of you, am I the only one? Because we used to play a lot of football, we used to play a lot of sports. My mom was like, no, 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 take your shoes off, right? Spiritually speaking, we need to do the same thing. Because life, unfortunately, in the process of life, while we're wearing our spiritual shoes, we tend to pick up some of the earthliness in the soles of our feet. Right? And when we come into our homes, we bring the earthliness into the home rather than taking our shoes off and say, whoa, 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 this is the sanctuary of the home. This is holy ground. And we need to treat this place with reverence. And ladies and gentlemen, that's why I believe the devil is being so successful. The presence of royalty changes the atmosphere. Is it possible we have lost this presence in our home? The same one who said, take your shoes off to Moses, is asking us today to do the same. Amen? And I believe that if we take our shoes off, spiritually speaking, we would be more respectful in the home. There would be more love in the home. There would be more grace in the home. There would be a little heaven on earth. And when we have visitors, wow, they wouldn't want to leave. I became acquainted with the teachings of the Bible. I became a Christian. I became a Seventh-day Adventist Christian because of somebody's home. It wasn't an evangelistic campaign. It wasn't a fancy evangelist. It wasn't a great preacher. It wasn't a, a wonderful camp meeting such as this. It was simply a father who took his experience with God very seriously and who dedicated a lot of time out of his very busy schedule, father of five children, to teach me, my two brothers, my brother's two roommates, and another friend. And because of the home circle, because as I walked into that home, I, I felt like I was walking into another planet. I said, what, what, where do these people come from? You know, like, who are these people? I remember the first time we visited them, we had our first vegetarian meal in my life. And it was amazing. I always thought veg vegetarian basically was just, you know, grass and water. 
you know? And I was like, wow, this food is amazing. Vegetarians have it all right. It's not that difficult. You know, I, you know, I grew up very carnivorous. You know, in my home, any, anything that moved you it was lunch. You know, throw it in the microwave. What is it? Don't ask. Just eat it, right? So when I went to this home, it was just so, ah, it was just, there was an aura. There was an atmosphere of, a, of peace in this home. And it was a very committed family of God. And they were literally modeling how to be a Christian without them even realizing it. And out of that home, by the way, I went to, uh, the, I call it the, the Institute of Evangelism, uh, the, the Johnson Institute of Evangelism. Because the family that, that taught me the Bible, their names is the, J- the Johnsons, Mike and Sherilyn Johnson. They live in Washington State now. And as they taught me the, the scriptures, that was my introduction to the Word of God. That was my seminary, amen? It was that dinner table. And there we were. There was only six students, though, so the tuition was pretty low, but that's all right. <laughs> so there were six of us, and we had Bible studies. And, I've, and I observed them, the way they talked to each other. I observed their recreation. I observed their humor. I observed at the things that they laughed at. I observed at the things that they said. All of this was education to me as what it means to be a Christian. And on top of that, they taught me about the most incredible book on the planet, which is the Bible. And we would have Bible studies four or five times a week. Not for 30, 40 minutes, for like three, four hours. Our Bible studies weren't 10, you know, they teach us, you know, I went to the Mission College of Evangelism, directed by Louis Torres, and we're taught, you know, when you go to somebody's home, you know, prepare something around 10, 15 verses. Don't overdo it because, you know, the attention spent. No, we didn't do none of that. Okay, we, (laughs) my my teacher went 35, 40 40 Bible takes, and we, we literally just, immersed ourselves in the word after four or five months six young people who had very very little connections with god were baptized into the seven day Adventist church why because there was a home that was living up to the expectation and the standard this presentation has a very very personal uh, i have very very emotional connections and, and appreciation to it because I am a product of what I like to call home evangelism, where somebody opened their home. Not only did they teach us the theory of truth, they exemplified the, 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 the truth, but they also loved us, accepted us, and they basically treated us as one of their, one of, one of their own. And when you look at some of the fastest growing, uh, in some countries where the, fa- where the church is growing the fastest, Africa, South America, and some third world countries, it is fascinating that the fundamental method of evangelism is not necessary, necessarily a 30-day prophecy seminar. Did you know that? It's actually a living room with about five or six people, a guitar, the Bible, and of course a lot of food. Amen? <laughs> that, that, that always melts the ice. When you look at the fa- where the church is growing the fastest, ladies and gentlemen, it is because Christians are using their homes as a vehicle to shed the light. And I believe we need to develop or resurrect this concept of the home circle in our day and age. What is it that God wants you to do in your home? Are you the priest of your home? What are the Trojan horses that the devil is introducing into your house? There are many, many different ways that the dragon can get into our homes. I remember listening to a story. I was at a ministerial retreat, and one of, the, one of the ministers was actually sharing about a case with his son. His son, of course, born and raised in the church, went through Sabbath school, pathfinders, you name it. And all of a sudden, out of the blue, the son started having insane nightmares. And the, and the father, the pastor, says, you know, well, we, we don't watch any horror movies. We don't, we don't, we're not involved in none of these things. Why are you having nightmares? And then after dialoguing with his son, he finally discovered, he finally realized that his son had a friend in school that lent him a book. And this book was kind of like a book about magic and a book about different things, right? And his son started reading it, didn't think much of it, and just kind of threw it in his closet. And the title of the book was Harry Potter. And the father says, you mean to tell me you've, read Harry, you've been reading Harry Potter? He says, well, yeah, just a little bit. See, the son didn't really know about it, but the father knew. He says, so where's that book? It's in the closet. He's like, you mean you have the book in this house right now? Yes. So the father went into the closet, found the book, 
and immediately destroyed it. That was the end of the nightmares, ladies and gentlemen. The father realized there was a Trojan horse in the house. He did something about it. Amen? And because of that, there was a restoration in the house. I remember when I went to South America, the first time I went to do an evangelistic campaign, we went to visit a family with a pastor, and the pastor's down there visiting machines. Amen? They start like at 5 in the morning and finish at midnight. Wow, it's, it's incredible. I, every time I go down there, I'm amazed. And we're visiting a family, and the pastor, after, after the visit, tells me that this family is related to another family that underwent a very tragic experience. This family, father, elder in the church, mother, deaconess, heavily involved in the church, this, they had one child, and the child, at uh, one particular point in his life, probably seven, eight, nine years old, got a hold of a game, got a hold of a board game. You may have heard of it. It's called the Ouija board. Parents totally oblivious of it. The son started messing around with it, started playing with it. And all of a sudden, the board started giving the son messages, telling him to do certain things. One of the things that the board told him to do was to hang himself. And one particular evening, the mother was finishing uh, supper preparations, and she called out the name of the son. No answer. She called out the name of the son. No answer. So she finally worked her way into the room. She walked into the room, and she didn't see anything. She's like, well, where is he? She went to the bathroom, nothing. She went back into the room just to make sure that she wasn't confused. And she looked around, and she noticed that the closet door was a little bit open, but not completely. She finally opens the closet, and what she sees is she sees her seven, eight, nine-year-old son hanging on a belt in the closet the mother like any uh, like any normal person of course would literally lose their mind panic she panicked she yelled she immediately went to the, the the legs of the son and she pulled him up to to undo the pressure undid the belt finally she called her husband she called the pastor she called everybody and they finally were able to get him breathing they took him to the hospital they waited the doctors came out and they said, we have good news and very bad news. The good news is that your son is going to survive. He's going to be all right. The bad news is that your son spent so much time hanging that it kept oxygen from going into his brain. Your son will never be the same. Your son is going to be basically handicapped. And the son, probably in his 20s right now, has never been the same. Tied to a wheelchair. Father, elder, mother, deaconess. Why? Because the devil introduced a Trojan horse into the home, yeah? It was unobserved by the parents. It got somehow access into a very integral part of the child's life, and it has impacted the child forever. What are the Trojan horses that God, that God is telling you to locate and to destroy? What are the Trojan horses that you have in your home Today, I remember before I became a Christian, me and my brother Jeffrey would listen oh, at night. We couldn't sleep at night. We would toss and turn. So what, what did we do? Instead of putting John Lomacang, amen, <laughs> we would put other stuff, and I won't even name the, 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 the content. All throughout the night, we'd put the music on repeat, yeah? And then we would wake up angry at each other. Is there a reason why? Well, of course, because you're feeding junk into your brain all throughout the night, and you're waking up basically a monster. A Trojan horse, in my experience. You know, even in our recreation, even in our entertainment, if we would do a careful analysis of our DVD collections, what would be the content, what would be the philosophies that our DVDs are portraying, are communicating? Did you know that DVDs are philosophies? Did you know that? Every film is a philosophy. And I'm, I'm not here to say every film is bad. I'm not here to, you know, be a, a, a TV police officer. That's not, my, that's not my purpose. I'm simply here to address a very, very important factor that we have maybe lost sight of. And that is an assessment of what contents do we possess in our homes that maybe are completely out of line with the message of Christ. Amen? And our young people, video games. Now they don't watch movies, they play video games because you could be part of the movie. When you play video games, you're in the movie, right? Have you noticed that in our generation, our young people can't even really have a... a, a decent conversation with each other 
The reason why is because they're so immersed into fantasy, so immersed into video games that they're basically, the video game continues even when they turn the video game off. They're still living in a fantasy world and it's so difficult to have a meaningful, intelligent conversation with our young people today. Simply, why? Because they have overindulged themselves in unrealistic things, yeah? And it has literally swamped and it has taken out all the spirituality that should be in there instead. Games like Resident Evil, which is a bestseller. Games like Doom, where it's basically you're literally carrying weapons and you're shooting people. And then, we, and then we wonder why our high school kids go to school with real guns and actually play out that which they're playing at home. Again, a Trojan horse that we actually buy. We don't even... It's not something that comes to us. It's actually something that we go to it. And at times we're willing to pay. All I'm saying is that we need to really be careful at the things. And it's not, sometimes it's not even things. Sometimes it's attitudes. What Trojan horse attitudes are you bringing into your home? Maybe it's just a bad attitude. Maybe it's gossip. Maybe after church you're coming to your homes and you're talking about everybody else's problems at home in the presence of your children. And you're basically training your children to basically gossip and perpetuate everybody else's bad laundry. All of these things, my friends, just perpetuates the fundamental problems that we have at church. Not only at church, but even in our society. I believe that if we have a revival in the home, not only will it revive our churches, it will literally revive our entire communities. The, the home is the epicenter of culture. And if we can save our homes, I believe we can save our, our neighborhoods as well. Is the dragon knocking on your door? Is he ringing your doorbell? Well, I have good news because in Revelation chapter 3, there's somebody else that's also knocking on your door. There's two people that are trying to get into your home, amen? And they're playing for keeps. Revelation chapter 3. And as you go into Revelation chapter 3, another story is reminded. I remember when I was working as a Bible worker in Brooklyn, in New York City. Anybody from New York City here? We have one person from New York City. We have actually a few. I remember I was in Brooklyn, and there's a particular area in Brooklyn where it feels like you're not in the United States. You know what I'm talking about? Because you smell pasta, and you, hear, you see people on the corner of the streets talking like this. You know what I'm talking about? It's the Italian area. That's where I actually was working. I was working in that area along with the Russian Orthodox Jewish neighborhood. New York City is a fascinating place if you, have, if you haven't been there. Um, so I was working in the Brooklyn area, going, knocking on doors, and I met a particular um, lady who was Italian, like fresh from Italy. And she invited me in, and she showed me about, she talked to me about her, her religion, you know, she was Roman Catholic, etc. Very, very wonderful lady, very, very Christian lady. And she told me about a particular issue that she had in her home where she would hear voices. And when she told me this, I kind of just ooh, <laughs> took a little quick glance at where the door was, and I continued talking to her. <laughs> Okay, it's about three feet away. Okay, this is good. And she was telling me that, that, you know, it was coming from a particular area in her home. And she's like, do you, want to, do you want to see this place, where it's coming from? And in my heart, I was thinking, no. But what I said was, yes. And I thought to myself, why am I saying yes? So she grabs me by the hand. She says, come. And she takes me downstairs to the basement. And I'm thinking, Lord, save me. Save me, Lord. <laughs> Little lady, this, this tall. And we go down there, there's a lot of things that are still in boxes, etc. And she says, it's coming from over here. So I went over there, and it was like a statue. It's like, is this yours? No, it was here when I moved in. And it, it looked very weird. It looked like a cross between, how can I describe it? It's kind of like a cross between a porcupine and like a samurai. Yeah, I know. It's, it's, it's like, how do you fit those two pictures together? It's like a little statue, porcupine with spikes, and like a samurai. And she says, it was here when I got here. And I said, well, you probably should get rid of this thing. Because first of all, it doesn't look very friendly. Spikes, you know? So she gets rid of it. And I come back three days later. And I said, so how are the voices? And she says, I don't hear any more voices. They're gone. And I said, praise God. Because again, the devil had a Trojan horse in her home. Amen? What are the Trojan horses in your home? Revelation 3 verse 20. 
The Bible tells us that there's somebody else knocking on your door. Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will do what? Come into him and dine with him and he with me. Ladies and gentlemen, in the book of Revelation, we're told that there's two door knocks. The dragon is trying to knock on your door, and as soon as you open the door, he's going to throw a few Trojan horses inside your home. So that when the sun goes down, his soldiers are going to come out of the Trojan horses and basically attack you spiritually. There's somebody else knocking at your door. His name is Jesus. And Jesus wants to become not a weekend visitor. He wants to become an integral part of your family. He wants to participate in all of your family time. He wants to participate in your family recreation. He wants to be a part of the conversation at the dinner table. If Jesus is inside your home, when the dragon knocks on your door, you politely ask Jesus to answer the door. When the dragon sees Jesus, he'll say, Ooh, sorry, I think I got the wrong house number. Ladies and gentlemen, the reason why our homes are the way they are is because the devil has easy access into our homes. Why? Because Christ is not a part of our lives in our homes. He's simply a part of our lives on the weekends at church. And that's where we don't have power. That's where we don't have the umph. That's where we don't have revival. The final showdown and the great controversy between good and evil will not take place in the pews. It will not take place on the pulpit. And believe it or not, it's not even going to take place in the potluck, even though sometimes you wonder. Right? But it's going to take place inside your home. The test of discipleship is not how well you look at church. If that was the case, a lot of us would be in trouble. Amen? Or the test of discipleship is not how you conduct yourself on Sabbath in the foyer. The test of discipleship will be how you talk to people when you're in your pajamas. Amen? When you're in your house slippers, when your guard is down, when nobody else is looking, when you're in the company of your family, how do you conduct yourself? I believe that's the fundamental issue in the last days. And the reason why Pentecost was such a powerful thing in Acts chapter 2 is because the Bible says that the church would spend time every single day going from house to house, visiting each other, breaking of bread in fellowship and in prayer. But that isn't, that's something that is no longer seen anymore. And the reason why we see our churches suffering is simply because there's a lack of home spirituality. And then when you go through a panorama of Scripture, in our part two message, we're going to uncover even more. We're going to go through the Old Testament and see practical examples of people who've actually prepared their homes, literally speaking, in the midst of crisis, in the midst of calamity, in the midst of catastrophe, in the midst of destruction. And you know that the Bible's history will repeat itself. And the million-dollar question, ladies and gentlemen, is how is your home going to answer to the attacks that it receives from the outside? Today, as you take a careful consideration of your home, of your family, where are you in your spiritual walk? Where is Jesus in your home? Is Jesus just somebody that is uh, on a portrait in the, in the wall of your kitchen? That you look and you say, oh, that's such a beautiful picture. And that's pretty much it. Or is Jesus an active member of your family? One of the things that I encourage anyone who is serious about reviving their spirituality in the home is spending family time together in prayer. Spend 10 to 15 minutes in prayer. My worship leader, Virgil Bello, he's our worship leader at church, and he put together a manual. And he said, Pastor, I feel very convicted. I don't spend enough time in the Bible at my home as I should. He's a youth Sabbath school teacher. He put a manual together and he says, I want to give this to all the fathers so that they could take initiative. And the manual has scripture, it has songs, and it has prayer requests. How many of you today recognize this need to prepare your home for the final crisis and would like to say, Jesus, I want to open my door to you? Amen. Let's pray together.